Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel reading is John chapter 20, beginning with the 19th verse. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called a twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my fingers in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I want to take you on a journey with me real fast. I want you to get in your car, in your mind's eye, head down 77 South, take a left on 26 East, and then get on dreaded 95 South. I did this this past week for a quick trip to a place that holds something special for me, a place where I can just go and feel at peace and really connected to God. I go down to the St. Simons, Brunswick area, usually after Easter every year. It's where my aunt and uncle live, and it's a place where I can just relate. I have this relationship with them that is incredible. It's wonderful. We wake up early. We have coffee together. We talk about life. We share about what's been happening. But it's also beyond that. It's a place where I have a relationship, I feel, with the ocean and with the beautiful Spanish moss and the live oaks as they cover and canvas the roads of St. Simon's Island. It's a place of peace. It's a thin place, if you will, where I can really connect to God and experience that deep relationship. But it goes beyond that. I also have a relationship with one of their neighbors. And we share a special bond over something we both love to do, flounder gigging. And it's, it's okay, it's fun, it's good, it tastes good. And so every year for the past five or six years, I've been able to go down there and enjoy flounder gigging. But yes, that's great. Yes, it's fun to fill the cooler up with some flounder. But what's really cool is the relationship, and his name is Dan, he and I share together. And he and I go out underneath the moon, and we just sit in the boat, and we talk. We share stories about his kids. He's got a 12-year-old boy who plays baseball. He sadly broke his arm a few weeks ago, and I can relate to that because I love playing baseball. Um, he has this daughter who is incredible. She's in high school. She's already defeated cancer not once but twice. She has defeated 
defeated childhood leukemia. She's a fighter. She, I hear the stories that he shares about her, how proud he is of her. And she has this pretty cool relationship. I got to brag about her for a little bit. Some guy named Tim Tebow, um, she really relates to well. And he comes by and he actually has written a couple books and she, he talks about her in one of his books. And you can just feel this connectedness. And I can just feel this connectedness with Dan as, as we're gigging some flounder or just sitting around my uncle's living room and we're all talking and sharing what's been going on. These relationships that I speak of are I, at fault of mine. Is I forget to text or I forget to call and check in as often as I should with my family or with my buddy Dan. But I'm sure we all have those relationships, right? Where you may not be in contact as much as you like, but the beautiful thing is when you start talking with this person or talk, start talking with this relative of yours, it's like nothing has gone by. You can just pick up right where you left off and you have this beautiful relationship that keeps on building and building. Usually these um, relationships are marked by certain characteristics. They're marked by the person who has been with you through some troubling times, or they're marked by somebody who's resilient with you when you are hurting, or you need somebody to undergird you and just to lift you up when it feels like everything's crumbling around you, or that person who celebrates with you when big life events happen. We have those relationships, don't we? We, we really like relationships. We really like to get into them. We really like to have them. And, and I would say that's due to it being in our DNA as Christians. It's really due to it being in our DNA as just human beings. We are created by the utmost relationship guide that we could ever seek. God. God in the triune state is God the Father, Jesus Christ, the, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It shows us what a healthy and wonderful relationship is to look like. That's within us. It's what we read about. It's what we learn about. It's what we study. It's what we're supposed to live. And it's what we're supposed to be about. And so when we think about relationships, we have to think about what are we pouring into? Or who is pouring into us? And how are we pouring into? Are we pouring into negativity? Or are we pouring into positivity? Are we lifting each other up? Are we reaching out to celebrate the high moments of life? When I think about the scripture that we just heard read this morning, usually we hear it as cast off as the Doubting Thomas scripture. The scripture that's always, oh, poor Thomas, he's the doubter. Oh, poor Thomas, he doesn't really trust or he doesn't really believe. But I'd like to challenge your perspective on that, that we no longer think about it only as doubting Thomas. I'm not going to rework all your theological minds right now, but I just want you to look at it in a different way. What if we really stop to think about, you know what? Was Thomas doubting if we go back a little earlier in John and we read the scripture where John and, and, and the Jesus and all the disciples are all together and they're circled one another, and Thomas is the one, this is paraphrased, you have to look it up, and, and he says to everybody, yo, let's go to the cross and die with Jesus. That doesn't sound like a doubter to me. That sounds like somebody who's really convicted by their faith. It sounds like somebody who's really willing to put themselves out there. He has that type of relationship with Jesus that he's willing to go to the cross, a place of pain, a place of death, a place, though, also of hope and promise for us all. So when we think about the text moving forward, we we need to think about it all inclusive of all the scripture that's put out there, not to think of Thomas just as a doubter, or not to think, oh, he just is doubting, but somebody who has an invested relationship with Jesus, a relationship that will change the world, the relationship that turns the world upside down and gives us all a new perspective. We have to remember that these disciples us. Think about it. In the past two weeks, think about all the services. Think about all the traditions. Think about all the rituals that we have gone through. You know, two weeks ago was Palm Sunday. We were celebrating it. We were cheering on. We were bringing the palms down. The kids were bringing them in. We were celebrating. Oh my gosh, wonderful. Jesus is triumphantly entering. Ten days ago, Jesus washed the disciples' feet 
upstairs in a real intimate relationship forming way saying guys you know you know what's coming in a day's time you know what's about to happen to me don't you now that i've done this now that i've shown you how to treat one another go and do likewise they're in the upper room they're locked away by themselves and then just nine days ago jesus hung on the cross sacrificing himself for all of us here everybody in the world and then a week ago we celebrated didn't we we shouted hosanna we lift up the cross we shout saying hallelujah jesus christ is raised our lord and savior the resurrection is fulfilled life eternal is finally ours we captive capture it we hold on to it but it's not for us just to hold on to it's for us to take and share and give out to others so here we are, and to say that we didn't go through a whirlwind would be a misnomer. We, we just lived this. And so for the disciples, it was the same thing. There they are in this upper room. They're scared to death of the Jewish authorities. They're crouched down in the upper room again, trying to figure out all that has transpired, and dare I say, probably have forgotten of some of the teachings over the past three years of Jesus, and saying, well, what should we do? Where should we go? Should we just go back to fishing? Should we go back to tax collecting? What is it that we're to do? And Jesus shows up, and he offers his message to some guys he has a really good relationship with, and says, peace, peace be with you. I've got you. He doesn't only say it once, he doesn't say it twice, he says it three times, like, peace, like, settle down, guys, I got you. But we can't blame the disciples for being confused. We can't blame them for being bewildered by everything that's happening. But what we do is celebrate that Jesus, showing us what it means to have this type of relationship, has come back in real time to affirm the teachings that he had put before them for the three years leading up to this moment. Three years of teaching, three years of being their personal rabbi, three years of sharing fishing stories, three years of figuring out who was a morning person or who was a night owl, three years of really getting to know one another. And he shows back up and they are overwhelmed they are freaking out, not knowing how to handle this situation. And Jesus wants them to calm down because I'm sure somebody shrieked that night saying, oh my gosh, he's back. And the dogs start barking in the neighborhood and they don't want to draw attention to themselves at this moment. And he calms them down and says, look, I'm back. I'm here as I promised. I'm here to lead people in a new way. I'm here for you to see this, to believe in this that others might know and mothers might hear the story and embrace it fully. Embrace the wholeheartedly of what is before you this day. And after them, they calmed down and sat back down, I'm sure Matthew did a head count real fast and noticed that somebody was missing. Well, where was Thomas? No fault of Thomas's. He was probably too cramped in that upper room, or maybe he had some business to attend to, but he wasn't there on that first appearance. So the disciples, with the relationship that they have with Thomas, got excited, and they hurried out, and they went and told Thomas, they said, look, Jesus came back as he said. Jesus was the one that helped roll the stone away. Jesus was the one that came back and told Mary and Martha to come and tell us, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And Thomas says, well, where is he? Where is Jesus? I need to see him. I need to touch him. I need to feel him. I need to have his presence with me. And this got me to thinking, don't we have Thomases in our world? Don't we have those neighbors around us who are just aching to experience the love of Jesus from the church? The church that proclaims that we're going to be love and peace and compassion and mercy and grace and hope. Do you think there's neighbors out there saying, well, well, where is Jesus? If this is what the church is to be and not just the Methodist church, but the Presbyterian church, the Baptist church, all the churches out there, well, where is this peace? Where is this love? Where is this acceptance? Where is this hospitality? Where is it? 
I bet if you were to think right now and if you were to start to jot down names, you could pick out a couple people in your life, in your circles of friends or your neighborhoods or the stretches of your driving or wherever it might be, and you might be able to write down a couple of names who need to feel and to see and to have a tangible connection with Jesus. And that's our responsibility. That's our task. We don't have to. We get to do this. We get to take the good news out into the world. We get to share the love of Jesus Christ with our neighbors. We get to bring about the resurrection in real time for people. One thing we can't do is think, oh, resurrection promises us eternal life, so we're just going to wait for that as it comes. No. The resurrection is to be lived right here, right now, living it out in faith, committing ourselves daily to walk with our neighbors to meet them where they are, to get hand in hand with them. If we think about this passage, notice that Thomas didn't come running to meet Jesus. Notice Jesus didn't say, hey, look, you need to meet me here at this time, at this corner, at this boat, at this coffee house, at this Harris Teeter. Notice he didn't say any of that. Instead, Jesus met Thomas where Thomas was. For us as the church, we are called to meet our neighbors where they are. We can't just have this audacious goal thinking like, oh, they're just going to, everybody's going to come through the church doors. That'd be wonderful. We want that. We would love to have that. But we have a task that we get to go out into this world, making Jesus known, making the resurrection known, living it out with our neighbors. We get to be in the presence of one another. We get to allow people to share and the hope that the resurrection offers us all. Jesus met Thomas where Thomas was, in his room, in his place. How many neighbors are we meeting in their rooms, in their place of hardship, in their places of struggle, in their places of down and out, or in their places of joy and celebration? Are we there with them? Are we forming the relationship with them? Are we taking the time to invest all of ourselves, not expecting anything on the return? We can't go into forming relationships thinking there's going to be a great return of investment. That's, that's not what we can think about. When we invest into a relationship, we just pour and pour ourselves out, pouring the Holy Spirit into those who are near us, sharing the hope and sharing the peace that is the real time, real life, Jesus. When we think about this passage, I ask that you no longer consider it doubting Thomas. I can ask you to consider it as a charge, a challenge, that you will seek those relationships, that you will seek those connections in life, that you will invest into your neighbors, that will you invest into your families, that you will invest into your best friends, that you will invest in making up with somebody who might have harmed you, and that you forgive them with the Holy Spirit that has been poured out on us all, that we might have healthy relationships with those in our midst. When Jesus said, I breathe out unto you the Holy Spirit, that wasn't just for the disciples in the upper room. That's for us all to breathe in that new life, to breathe in that new relationship, to go into this world letting the resurrection be known to all we come in contact with. Let's be about that.
Hey, thank you for watching. And uh, we hope you got something out of that. If you have any feedback for us, any response that was helpful to you, we'd, we would love to hear that. Please let us know. And everything that we put out is free and we want it to be that way. But if you're able and feel led to, uh, to support the mission of our church or the cost of providing this online content, here's how to do so.